Welcome. It's, uh, it's good to see so many of you here on a Monday night. Don't you have anywhere better to be, folks, on a, on a Monday night? But anyway, it's, uh, it's lovely to see you all uh, to this, the, uh, the next in our series of Highland Church History Lectures. Uh, we've had a few of them. We, uh, we started off with the Highland Church History Conference uh, a couple of years ago, and, uh, and we're just trying to keep this, uh, uh, this uh, focus going uh, as part of the activities uh, of um, Highland Theological College uh, in this, this part of the world. Uh, we are delighted to co-sponsor this evening's event with uh, uh, Christian Focus uh, Publishing, and uh, we'll hear uh, a little bit more from William Mackenzie in just a moment about uh, the bookstall that Christian Focus have for us uh, this evening. Now, as you know, uh, you, well, I hope you know that you're here to hear a lecture on St. Columba. If you're not, you're in for a bit of a shock because that's, what, that's what's going to be happening here tonight. Um, the Reverend Dr. Bruce Ritchie will be uh, presenting some of the research that has gone into the writing of his book, uh, Columba, The Faith of an Island Scholar. And we, uh, we look forward to hearing what, uh, what Bruce has to say to us uh, about this uh, remarkable figure in, uh, in Scottish church history, um, and indeed in, uh, uh, in Scottish history. Uh, the, the, there's, there's, there's something about the, the, the figure of, of St. Columba. Um, uh, at, at HTC, we, we describe ourselves as teaching theology from uh, from an evangelical and uh, reformed perspective. Uh, and by and large, the, the evangelical and reformed communities tend not to do saints. Uh, and, yet, um, uh, and yet, of course, one of the, the new charges, one of the, the, the Church of Scotland new charges in, uh, in Inverness is called St. Columbus. Uh, and there's a sense in, in which Columba bridges that, uh, that Protestant Catholic gap uh, that so often uh, arises in, the, uh, in our world. Uh, equally, from, uh, from time to time, um, from time to time within UHI, is there anyone here from UHI other than Ebby? <laughs> Ebby won't tell tales out of school, okay. Uh, from, uh, from time to time within UHI, within the University of the Highlands and Islands, they, uh, uh, they, they truck one or other of us out either to say grace at a formal meal or, uh, uh, or, or, or to offer a prayer at some, uh, at some big public event. Uh, and, and normally the, you know, the involvement of any, in this secular world in which we live, uh, the involvement of any sort of uh, Christian practice uh, in these very kind of public uh, and secular events goes down like a lead balloon. You know, it's, uh, it's not... Uh, uh, it's not very, uh, it doesn't go down very well by and large. Uh, and yet I was asked to give a blessing uh, at the, uh, the inauguration of the university back in 2011 when the, the, the university was granted title, the University of the Highlands and Islands was granted title. And um, uh, knowing that, uh, that there are always a, a wide diversity of views and opinions uh, at these sort of events. What I actually did was I, I read uh, a blessing that is traditionally associated with, uh, with St. Columba. And for the first time ever, uh, I received a, a positive response uh, from folks in, uh, in response uh, to that. And so there's a sense in which Columba not only bridges the uh, the, the, the Protestant Catholic divides, but Columba also uh, as, uh, as just a kind of statuesque figure in the, the history of Scotland, also in some ways bridges the, the sacred secular uh, divides of, uh, of our society. And I have to confess uh, that there is a, a, a level of, uh, of personal interest as well in, the, uh, in hearing anything in St. Columba. Um, uh, I live just at the foot of Craigfadrick Hill uh, in, in Inverness 
and uh, uh, of course that's the 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 site of uh, of King Brood's fort and reputedly uh, Columba uh, came to the fort of King Brood in 564 <laughs> typically, it depends which scholar you, uh, you adhere to, but uh, Columba reputedly came to the, the fort of King Brood to, uh, to ask permission to evangelise the Picts in the north uh, of Scotland, and uh, I, I either walk to the site of that fort or past the site of that fort, fort with, with my dug um, most days, so there's, uh, uh, there's a real sense of... Uh, personal interest, personal connection with, uh, uh, with that, uh, that history. So I think, uh, I think St. Columba holds uh, a great fascination for many of us um, today, as is, uh, is evidenced by another um, excellent turnout. And we look forward very much uh, to hearing what you have to say uh, this evening, uh, Bruce. But before we hear from Bruce, uh, we'll pray. Uh, and then we'll sing, and then William will come and speak to us. Let's uh, unite our hearts in prayer together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father and God of all the ages, we thank you that you are the God who brings light. We thank you that you are the God who speaks truth. We thank you, holy God, that you have uh, broken into our world in, uh, in amazing ways, through your Son, Jesus, and we thank you that you continue to break into this world by your Spirit. And Holy One, we thank you for uh, the, the traditions of our forebears. We thank you for the ways that you have worked in generations past. And we thank you that you are still active in your world through your people today. And Holy One, uh, we pray that you will help us to learn important le lessons from those who have gone before us, to learn more of who you are, to learn more of how you work in this world, and to learn more of how we can live for your glory in this, our generation. And so, Lord God, we do pray that you would bless our time together this evening and that in all things you would move us on that we may love you more and respond to you more fully and this we ask in Jesus name Amen, Amen. Let's sing together uh, folks we're going to rise to sing Be Thou My Vision
you folks. It's uh, nice to be here with you. There was one D missing. Did you notice it on the title for this evening? Devils, Demons, Deliverance, Dingwall. We're in Dingwall, and Dingwall needs deliverance, and so does the Highlands of uh, Scotland. Uh, Bruce spoke to me three or four years ago about this book, and I said to myself, nobody's any more interested in Columba. But he persevered, and uh, he eventually persuaded me that it was something worth doing, and I'm very glad that we did it. I find churches all over the world calling themselves St. Columba. There was one in Malawi, and they have no idea who it's called after. There's churches called St. Columba. There's one in Melbourne. I've been in it. They don't know why it's called St. Columba. So we need to know who St. Columba was. I'm going to read a part of Michael Haken. Michael Haken's commendation of this book. Living as he did in the twilight of antiquity, the memory of the remarkable Celtic Christian leader Columba has been obscured by legend. In this new study, Bruce has put all who love the story of the Celtic church in his deck. His life in Ireland before coming to Iona, the Iona mission and his thought, a solid historical monograph marked by scholarly work. Ritchie's biography is also eminently readable, a rare combination and a delight to be recommended. I have also enjoyed it myself, and I'm going to take the liberty of reading to you two very short pieces from the book. Columbus's emphasis was on the sovereignty of God, the reality of human sin, the depth of the fall of humanity, the power of divine judgment, the seriousness of Christ's second coming, and the reality of hell. That's a, min that's a message that we need to rediscover in our own community. He made, as you might appreciate me saying it anyway, he made a great thing of the Psalms. He was very enthusiastic about the Psalms, and there's a lot about his use of the Psalms in the book, particularly Psalm 68, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. He was so concerned about the souls of men. Are we? This book, I'm surprised to tell you, is available for £17.99 in shops across Britain. But for some reason, my colleagues at the back there have got it at £9 tonight. So it's not normally at £9, and it'd be a good Christmas gift to give to somebody, a good gift for yourself, a unique opportunity to purchase this book. And for no additional charge, Bruce will sign it. I hope it'll be no additional charge anyway. I'm going to take the liberty of mentioning one or two other books. Uh, this is brand new. It is not in the bookshops yet, but there are a few copies there. The Creaking on the Stairs. It's about Mez McConnell, the guy who started 20 Schemes. It's about his abuse as a child. And Rosaria Butterfield says of this book, this is the most disturbing book I have ever read. But I cannot recommend it highly enough. Who will I mention? Brian Croft. Never have I experienced a book that is for the abused and the abuser, the victimized and the tormentor. 
and the power of the gospel being the answer for all. A lady whom I respect read this book this weekend and got in touch with me today. And I said, I hope you didn't read it before you went to bed. She said, I couldn't put it down. It's saturated with the gospel. And it's what's happening all around us. Creaking on the stairs. It's beautifully written. And uh, I would commend that book to you. And two others. Children's books. Some of you will recall the Old Testament scholar who died a couple of years ago, Alec Motier. He was here once. He was sitting where Andy McGowan is sitting. At a funeral in this building. And he was crying like a baby. He was a good friend and a couple of years before he died, we wrote him saying, would you like to do something for children? And he said, no, I'm not able, I'm not fit for it. But if your wife, Karen, is prepared to do something, she can do anything with my work, provided she's not gone off her trolley. And his letter is in here. And what Karen has done is taken a number of the Psalms that Alec Motier retranslated and presented them along with a devotional piece, practical devotional piece for children and for families. Psalms for my day. I will read what Jonathan Lamb, the former uh, man in charge of Keswick, said. In a world wired for sound, it's vital to introduce our children to the best songbook there is. Psalms for my day. And one other one, which hardly needs description. God is better than trucks. Now we go to pastors' conferences quite often across the world, and we'll have a pile of these books. And we're hoping that these pastors might take commentaries, systematic theology, but this is the first one to sell out. God is better than trucks. So if you have a boy, a little boy somewhere, a boy you know, and you'd like to give him something that would tell him and his parents the gospel, this could be the one for you. So thank you for your support. It's good to be here. And I'll now hand over to the man who's going to speak to Dingwall about devils, demons, and deliverance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, uh, Jamie, and thank you very much, William, for um, in introducing the meeting um, tonight. Columba did not discover America. That was Columbus. But Columba did discover the Loch Ness Monster. Or, as it's described by his biographer, Adomnan, he discovered a water beast in the River Ness. He also, as Jamie pointed out, taking half my talk with him, he also met the famous and powerful Pictish king, King Broody, or King Breedy, um, probably at Kirkpatrick. Columba wasn't the first missionary to Scotland. He was after Ninian, and even Ninian was probably not the first missionary to Scotland, but Columba was maybe the most important one. And what we're going to do tonight is to talk just a little bit about his life, but to talk much more about his mind and about his faith. So Columba, he, he was born in Ireland at Garton in northwest Ireland, probably 521. Some of the other ancient annals say 518, but probably 521. His parents were probably first generation Christian believers. And their part of Ireland before that had had druidical influences. And it's probable that his two parents were first or at the most second 
generation Christian believers. And so he, he, he lives at that time, he, he lives on that cusp of a change from paganism to Christianity. His mother, Ethne, there's a strong tradition that she was buried on an island that Columba lived on for a short while in the Garvelis, just off the west coast of Scotland. Again, we don't know if that's exactly the case. He came from arist aristocratic um, tradition, and therefore there was a vague chance that he himself could have become one of the, the many kings of Ireland. But when he was a, a young boy, he, he was sent by his parents to be brought up, to be fostered by the local monastery. And what happened was that before Christianity came to Ireland, it was customary for young boys, or at least one, to be sent to the local Druid to be brought up. And then when the culture became Christian, it became a case of them being sent to the local monastery to be brought up. And so Columba was brought up within that monastic environment. And within that monastic environment, he learned what it was within Irish Christianity to work as a member of a team. And all through his life, Columba depended on other people in his team. And so we ask the question, who was in Columba's team? Now his team is different because some of these members we're going to talk about were alive when Columba was alive and some had lived quite a while beforehand. But these are major influences or major colleagues in Columba's life. In goal, St. Patrick, the Irish backstop. Patrick lived about 100 years before Columba, and through Patrick, most of Ireland had finally become under Christian influence. So he was a major figure in Ireland. And then along the back line, you got very famous people. You've got Martin of Tours, again, before Columba. But the life of Martin was a book that every trainee monk would read. And so Martin was one of the ideals of what it meant to be a Christian monk. The two center backs, John Cassian, Basil of Caesarea, they're important because they are the only two theologians mentioned in contemporary biographies of Columba. Two theologians that he himself read and studied and was influenced by. Antony of Egypt was one of the first hermits who went into the Egyptian desert for the monastic life. And a book about him by Athanasius, The Life of Antony, again, that molded the whole thinking of the church and continent of Europe in Britain, in Ireland, molded the whole thinking of the church, what it meant to be a monk. And every single trainee monk in Columbus' time would read and study and read again Athanasius' book, Antony of Egypt. In modern times, it would have been a christian focus publication. The midfield, Athanasius himself, again a couple of centuries before Columba, but very influential in the type of thinking. Finian of Clonard, who was Columba's own teacher when he was learning to be a priest. And then Bethany, who was a colleague of Columba, who came to Iona with him. And then in the forward line, you've got Comgol, you've got Columba, you've got Brendan, and they were contemporaries. And they each had their own mission in different parts of Ireland, in different parts of the Hebrides, and Brendan may well have gone much further afield, even as far as Iceland. Columba was born in Ireland. He was a Christian working there. And he worked in Ireland until he was 42 years old. And so he had a complete ministry in Ireland up to that point. And during that time, he founded many monasteries, he founded many churches, he traveled over mainly the north of Ireland. And then the annals tell us that he set sail in the 42nd year of his age. 
Was it a midlife crisis? Or was it something more profound? Well, different scholars have different views. Uh, a dominant Columbus biographer says that Columba wanted to be a pilgrim for Christ. And so he traveled away from his own country up to um, Mull of Kintyre, and then eventually to Ione itself. So Adomnan emphasizes the idea of being a pilgrim. The great historian Bede, the great English historian, says that Columbus' aim was to evangelize the northern Picts. And so he emphasizes Columbus' missionary uh, motivation. Modern Irish scholar, uh, scholar Mary Herbert says that he left Ireland to break away from tribal associations. And what she meant was that because Columba was himself an aristocrat, then he may have felt that staying in Ireland, he could never just be an ordinary Christian. And only if he moved away from that could he begin to really isolate himself from what could be the privileges of luxury and of his family line, and so on. Ian Finlay, um, a Scottish author, says he went to shore up church and state in the new colony of Dalriata. See, in the north of Ireland, there was a, col there was a nation called Dalriata, and then it crossed over into Argyll, and it became Scottish Dalriata, sort of semi-independent, semi-autonomous. And one theory is that Columba went and joined that to help establish um, that particular colony of, of Christian people in the west of Scotland. One book, the Amra, written just a year after Columba himself died, says he was buried in Britain away from Ireland for fear of hell. And this alludes to an ancient tradition that Columba because of a long story, became the unwitting cause of a battle in Ireland at which thousands of people were slain. And as part of his penance, he had to promise to leave Ireland and to win as many souls to Christ as men had perished in the battle. Now, that legend isn't actually mentioned in the earliest books. It only comes in hundreds of years later. But the Amra has this very suggestive sentence that he, let, he was buried in Britain for fear of hell, for fear that he might still be judged for his unwitting role in what had been quite a terrible battle, almost going as an act of penance. But eventually, he arrives, and he arrives in Iona, of course, with, by tradition, 12 companions, there may have been an existing Christian community on Iona, we're not sure. And who gave Columba permission to settle there? Was it King Connell of the Dalriatic um, Christians, Irish, in Argyll? Was it King Brood from Inverness of the Picts? And there's two different traditions saying one gave it to him. The other tradition says the other gave it to him. We can't be certain. But certainly, this is a place that Columba has made famous, Iona. But in order to find out more about Columba, of course, we have to ask ourselves, what are our sources for him? Our main source is a book, Adomnan's Life of Columba. You can find in all major book shops, very easy to read. And this was written by a dominant, who was an abbot of Iona a hundred years after Columba's time. Columba died 597, and the book was written almost exactly a hundred years later in 697. But when we come to this book, we very quickly ask ourselves the question, how do we actually read it? How can we actually use it to establish any facts at all? The Duke of Argyll, when he was trying to write about Columba in the mid-19th century, he thought, great, I've got a book about him written by somebody way, way back in time. And he started to read the book. And within a short time, he threw it across his study. And he says, this is hopeless. How can I use this to find out any facts at all? And other people have faced the same problem ever since. We do know that Adomnan, when he wrote his life of Columba, 
He was building on material gathered by other people. Abbot Segeni, just a few years after Columbus' death, he gathered material. Another abbot gathered more material. And then Adomnan used that material, incorporated it into his book as well. And then there was material in the oral tradition, and there's also material being sung by bards, by the bardic poets. In fact, there's a story in Adomnan that speaks of a, a group of robbers who are surprised by another group one evening. And the group of robbers had, had been drinking and be, they'd been singing songs. And some of them, in fact, had been singing songs about Columba because that had become part of the bardic tradition. And so from all these different sources, Adomnan collected his material and put it down in what we call his life of Columba. But his book, it's written in a strange way. It's written in three main sections, in three main parts. The first part is called His Prophetic Revelations. The second part is called His Miraculous Powers. And the third part is called His Visions of Angels. And so you've got these three distinct sections of Adomnan's book. And in each part, he talks about all the revelations that God has given Columba, and then he talks about all the miraculous things that God has done through Columba, and then he talks about the various visions that Columba has seen. Now, one scholar, James Bruce, he's analyzed these, and he says, now, why did Adomnan split it into these three groups? And he says, I think the answer is in Acts chapter 2, verses 17 and 19. Because in that part of Acts, the scripture says that God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams and I will show wonders in the heaven above and on the earth below. And James Bruce is saying, look, in that part of Acts is mentioning three things that will happen. There will be prophecies, there will be visions, there will be wonders. And what Adomnan has done is he's taken that group and he's structured his whole book around it. And for in Adomnan's mind, that is confirming that what God did through Columba was by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because it's fulfilling what is mentioned in Acts chapter 2. In his life of Columba, if you pick it up, if you read it, if you buy it in Waterstones, you very soon find out that it's not meant to be in time sequence. It's really written as a theological commentary on Columbus' life. It's looking at various themes, and it's writing about these themes in this style. It's written, this old book is written to prove Columbus' holiness by listing the times there has been prophecy, miracles, and visions. And part of the reason why Adomnan had to do that a hundred years after Columbus' death was because Columbus' life and work were beginning to be criticized. Columbus belonged to the Celtic Church, and then when the Roman Church became dominant, they began to almost try and undermine the work Columbus had done. And what Adomnan is doing, he is saying, look, we can see in what God did in this man that God's blessing was on him. And this cancels all these people who are trying to undermine his credibility there. So it's written to inspire new monks, to remind Northumbria and the north of England especially, which had been evangelized by monks from Iona, where their Christian faith had first come from. So he's defending the reputation of his founding father, Columba, by saying that God did these things in his life, therefore he must have been a man of God. There's other early sources um, we could look at. There's the Amra, the, the, this honor poem written within just a year of Columba's death in uh, 597 by Dallin for Gale, a blind poet. And it celebrates various aspects of Columbus' life, that he's a holy man of God, that he's a scholar. And it also mentions that he was a missionary to the Tayside region. 
You know, Jamie mentioned the fact that Columba came up the, the Great Glen and arrived near Inverness and met King Brood. But what the Amra tells us is that he was also a missionary in the Tayside region. In, in scholarship, this has spawned feverish speculation that maybe he was in one place but not in the other. And James E. Fraser, a modern scholar, has gone overboard on the fact that the Amra mentions that Columba went to Tayside but doesn't mention at all that he came up to Inverness. That's the sort of things that scholars like to argue about, as always. Apologies, Jamie. Yeah. Other early sources, there's a book that Columba himself wrote called The Altus Prasator, The High Creator. Its verses are in alphabetical order, copying the form of some of the Psalms. And the, there's another book, A Helper of the Workers. And modern scholarship judges that these two works were probably written by Columba himself. If you ever find this book, um, Iona, the earliest poetry of a Celtic monastery, edited by um, Tom Clancy and Gilbert Marcus of Glasgow University, then buy it. Because in a very scholarly way, they go through all the ancient Celtic literature, that they apply very strict criteria, and their conclusion is that these two works are by Columba. Other things that sometimes we get in prayer anthologies, where they say, you know, this prayer was written by Columba, sorry, Jamie, or, or, or they say this particular hymn was written by Columba, that they're not so sure. But Clancy and Marcus identify these two works as being authored by Columba himself. Columba, as a theologian, what did he believe and how did he apply that faith in his life? And this is what I want us really to focus on tonight. What did he believe? How did he think? What was his mindset? What was the, what was the mindset of, of a Christian in Ireland, in Scotland, in the 6th century? And how did they apply that to the Christian faith? The early medieval Irish church, it was independent of the church on the continent, what we call the Roman church, but it accepted all the main creeds of the church, like the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, etc., it also borrowed hymns and prayers from the universal church. And so the way that it worshipped and what it said in worship meant that it was aligned with the church throughout Christendom. It gave its students the same theological education that any trainee priest would receive anywhere in Christendom. And so being on what was called the edge of the world, as Scotland and Ireland and Britain were known, did not mean out in the sticks theologically. Having said that, it had its own way of doing things because it saw itself as independent, autonomous, and didn't need to listen to Europe too much. I hope that's not a political statement tonight. There. Yeah. Columbus' core theology. In the Altus Prasater, he mentions various things. Will you mention this before? It's that he says, it seems doubtful to no one that there is a hell down below. Uh, and so this very heavy realization means that whenever he indulges in evangelistic activity, it's with the aim, the primary aim of saving sinners from a lost eternity. Now, nowadays, there's a lot about Celtic spirituality. Uh, and some of it's very fine, very interesting. But when you read this stuff that's being produced in Celtic spirituality, when they mention the ancient saints, they nearly always speak just in terms of harmony with nature, justice and peace, and so on. And all these things are very, very fine. But modern Celtic spirituality hardly ever mentions this, which was central in Columbus' thinking. Without this, what Columbus did doesn't make sense. This was at the front of his mind. In terms of things like the Trinity, totally orthodox, he talked about the High Creator, with whom is the only begotten Christ and the Holy Spirit, co-eternal in the everlasting glory of divinity. We do not confess three gods, but say one God. Our faith is in three most glorious persons. So he believed about God 
what any Christian throughout Christendom believed. Entirely orthodox. Entirely orthodox. In fact, Columba would say that to be a Christian, you become a Christian when you say that the God you believe is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because you are acknowledging the identity of the true God. So for Columba, that would be what would make you a Christian. That you change your worship from pagan gods to worshiping Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We've mentioned the Celtic theology of nature. There's two views. One is the romanticized idea that there's a natural harmony between humans and animals, horses, storks, etc. And they, they refer to a fondness of Celtic saints for woods and wild places. The, the idea of the Spirit of God pervading both humans and the natural world. And the likes of George MacLeod, the Iona community, have this emphasis, a, a romanticist emphasis almost a green theology emphasis. And that's almost a popular way in which the old Celtic saints are interpreted nowadays. There's another view that even in these old saints, this thought in terms of conquest of nature, not so much harmony. Many stories of Celtic saints in conflict with nature, monsters from the deep, Loch Ness monster, are to be feared. Animals are seen as being connected with paganism. Nature is fallen, needs to be redeemed. And so the likes of Donald Meek, Marion Rakes, uh, John MacLeod, etc., and many, many other scholars would emphasize that this is how, if you're in the Celtic world, you would actually view nature. Not so much a harmony, but almost seeing nature as a dangerous place to be there. But when we come to Columbus, main calling, there are various factors that kick into this. Firstly, there's what I call his overarching motif. And Columbus' overarching motif is this. It is Christ's triumph over the devil and over all demonic forces which sets his people free. And this motif, this way of seeing things, dominates the whole of his thinking, the whole of his actions, the whole of his missionary work. So he has an overarching motif of Christ's triumph over Satan and setting God's people free. The way he would describe himself, a monk is called to be a miles Christi, a soldier of Christ. So the subtitle of of my book is The Faith of an Island Soldier. Uh, Jamie had a Freudian slip. He called him an island scholar. Both are in fact correct, but he he would see himself as an island soldier. His fundamental task, he would say the mission is to seek out and destroy the devil's power wherever he seeks to rule, and to do so through continuous spiritual warfare. Remember the old program, Mission Impossible? You know, it used to say, this is your mission if you choose to accept it. And so Columba would read this. He would say, the mission is to seek out and destroy the devil's power wherever he seeks to rule and to do so through continuous spiritual warfare. That is what he is called to do. So spiritual warfare. The key term is soldier of Christ. And that's the highest title given by a dominant to any serious Christian, any serious holy man or woman. It's rooted in the New Testament. We think of Ephesians 6. We think of the armor of God. It was an idea adopted early by the church fathers way back Clement of Rome in the late first century. And there's an assumption of aggressive warfare against the forces of evil rather than defensive warfare against the forces of evil. The battle is to be taken into Satan's territory. And Satan's territory is especially the desert and the air. And we'll come back to that. First of all, there's a concept of the desert in early Christian thought. Jesus encountered Satan in the wilderness, in the desert, the wilderness of Judea. And so that becomes quite a dominant way of thinking. 
And so a monk goes into the desert to engage with Satan, not to flee from the world. You know, nowadays we often describe them as recluses. But they wouldn't see themselves as recluses. They would see themselves as going into the very presence where the demonic is at its strongest in order to engage with them. Athanasius, his life of Anthony, we said, was a core text of all monasteries and studied by all trainees. And so the original desert fathers saw deserts of sand. Now, there's not many deserts of sand in Ireland or even in Scotland, apart from the beaches of the Outer Hebrides. And so instead of deserts of sand, they saw deserts of the ocean. Any small island, any uninhabited island, they would go and make that their desert, their lonely place, where they would encounter the spirits, the demonic spirits that they were there to fight. Just of interest, um, early Christian places of retreat in Scotland sometimes have disart in their name, and that comes from the early Celtic monks finding these as places of, of retreat. Now, that's straightforward. But then we have the concept of the air. And this takes us into some strange territory. The key verse that the early Christians picked up on was Ephesians 2.2. 2. And Paul in that verse says, You were following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is at work in the sons of disobedience. Now we nowadays, I think, would say that Paul was writing that in a metaphorical sense. It was interpreted literally by the church fathers. And so when Paul mentioned the princes of the power of the air, then they regarded the space of air between earth and heaven as hostile demonic territory. And this affected how they understood what Jesus did on the cross. See, nowadays, um, we would emphasize on the cross, Jesus paid a ransom. Uh, Jesus took the penalty for our sins. Um, Jesus paid the price for our sins. Now, these early Christian people in Ireland, they believed these things too, but they believed even more that what happened on the cross was that Jesus was lifted up from the earth into the air into demonic territory and on the air he battled in his death against demonic forces and finally overcome them but for them the significance is jesus the son of god being lifted into the air into the very territory of satanic forces and, and just to give an example, you know, one of the books that Columbo would read would be St. Athanasius' um, On the Incarnation, written a couple of hundred years before Columbus. Athanasius says this, he says, The enemy of our race, the devil, having fallen from heaven, moves around in this lower atmosphere, lording it here over his fellow demons in disobedience. He tries to cheat men and tries to prevent them from rising upwards. The apostle speaks of this according to the rule of the powers of the air who now works in the sons of disobedience. And he goes on, but the Lord came to overthrow the devil, purify the air and open for us the way up to heaven as the apostle said, through the veil that is his flesh. This had to be effected by death and what other death would these things have been accomplished by save by that which takes place in the air, I mean the cross. For only who expires in the cross dies in the air. So it was right for the Lord to endure the cross. For being raised up in this way, he purified the air from the wiles of the devil and all the demons. And he reopened the way up to heaven, saying again, Lift up your gates, princes, and be raised everlasting gates. And that was the way that all the church fathers thought. Tertullian, Oregon, Augustine, Casey, and Chrysostom, a whole list of them. The air is demonic territory. Jesus is lifted up in the air in the cross to confront the demonic. But when you die, you have to go from earth to heaven. And you have to pass through this hostile atmosphere. And we'll come back to that. 
So their view of the world was that we have the world here, we have the heavens above, but between them you have these demonic forces. And so that's, that's the world view. That's the way St. Augustine thought, that's the way Christensen thought, that's the way Patrick thought, that's the way Columba thought. And salvation is about overcoming the demonic in these circumstances. So Columba, in his poem, he writes these words, he says, Driven out from the midst, Lucifer was thrust down by the Lord, and the space of air is choked by a wild mass of his treacherous, invisible attendance. And so that's the mindset that Columba comes to. And this is part of the faith that he brings to Scotland. So in order to be a Christian, in order to do missionary work, you have to overcome Satan's rule. And so the fundamental spirituality is the battle between God and the, the demonic. And there are three key issues in this battle. Firstly, there's a recognition that Satan exercises an usurped authority over men and women. And that authority has to be destroyed. Secondly, that Satan keeps men and women in captivity and unable to free themselves. And so that captivity has to be broken. And the third aspect is that Satan and his demons inhabit the air, blocking the route to heaven, and therefore that barrier has to be overcome. Now this isn't traditional Reformed Calvinist theology, and it has certain dangers, as we'll see. So overcoming Satan's rule, the process, the first thing that has to happen, Columba would say, is that we have to Satan's usurped authority has to be destroyed. Satan exercises an authority, he exercises a false authority over humanity, and that has to be destroyed. And in contrast to Satan's pseudo authority, Jesus exercises true authority. And on the cross, Jesus carries himself into Satan's heartland in order to deal with that. And the resurrection proves that Jesus triumphed over Satan in his battle with the demonic on Calvary. The second thing is that men and women have to be freed from captivity. And, and this is central in Eddie, early medieval theology of Columbus' time. And in a liturgy, when they went through the liturgy on a Sunday, this is one of the emphases that they would have. It's called the harrowing of hell, the idea of sinners being rescued from Satan's captivity in Satan's hell. So for example, the, there's also what we call the Exodus motif. And Christians at that time focused very much on the idea of Israel's exodus from Egypt. And they saw that as, as, as a paradigm. They saw that as a, a pattern of redemption. And so just as Moses goes down into Egypt, where God's people are captive, and brings them out of Egypt. So Jesus goes down into where the demonic holds God's people captive and releases them from that. And this is a very powerful way of thinking that the Christians of Columbus' time have. There's also, of course, allusions in the New Testament of Jesus descending into hell and emerging with freed captives. And so they picked up on these allusions. And then also, as medieval Christians were thinking about these things, they thought, well, you know, in ordinary life, in ordinary warfare, whenever a general wins a battle, he then enters the capital city of his opponent and he frees all the prisoners. And they said to themselves, you know, it's like that when Jesus defeats Satan on the cross. He then enters Satan's capital, hell, and he releases the prisoners who are held there and sets them free. And so this again it is a dominant way of thinking in the Celtic mindset. But also involved in the process is opening up a route to heaven through the air. The time of death is a critical moment and the transition to heaven is perilous. Who would win? And the souls of believers need to break through the barrier of demons which block the path to glory. 
And in Columbus Day, Columba would teach that at death a final struggle over each soul takes place between the forces of Christ, angels, and the forces of Satan, demons. So if you become a Christian, as Columba would understand it, when you become a Christian, that's you being released from captivity. But when you die, you still have to make that transition to heaven. And in that transition, the demonic will try to recapture you. Will try to recapture you. And they would point, for example, to the same idea of Israel being released from captivity in Egypt. And they'd say, well, you know, there was a moment of release from captivity when they crossed the Red Sea. And then there was the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, and then the Jordan had to be crossed. And they would liken each stage to a stage of the Christian life. They'd say, well, there's your time of release from captivity, and then you live your life of 40 years or so, and then you still have to cross the Jordan. And that crossing can still be perilous, that crossing at death. So Columba says, I have seen holy angels fighting in the air against the powers of the adversary. They are battling in the air against the powers of the adversary who are seeking to snatch away the soul. So Christian people at that point didn't have what we would call a strong idea of assurance. It was still uncertain what would happen at the moment of death. And so this idea of assurance, early medieval theology has no clear doctrine of assurance, no clear idea of once saved, always saved. And the Exodus narrative that shaped the church father's understanding, not all who are liberated from Egypt reach the promised land. And they say, look, you know, not everybody who got out of Egypt made it in the end. And they'd say, maybe that's what happens to us as well. Maybe even though we've been rescued, we won't make the whole journey in the end. And also they'd say, look, if you look at human warfare, not everybody on the victor side survives the conflict. Some are lost. And so in Columbus theology, Christ's triumph gives the opportunity for a successful transition to glory at death. But ultimate success depends on purity of life, your penitential actions, the prayers of the church, and protection by holy angels on the journey. And this kind of theology seeps its way into the church's thinking, not just in Scotland and Ireland and Britain, but all over Europe, that a person can be a Christian, but yet their final salvation is not, is not assured. And in a sense, you could almost say a thousand years later, this is why we need to have the Reformation because it's lost the heart of the gospel. Things have become dependent again upon what we do, how much we purify ourselves through our lives, how much penance we pay through our lives in order to make that transition to glory. And the Reformation has to recapture the biblical teaching that we're saved purely by the grace of God and purely uh, by God's power. So as you see, the, the gospel that Columba brings to Scotland is a mixed gospel. On the one hand, he's bringing a clear knowledge of who God is. He's talking about Jesus. He's talking about the cross. He's talking about salvation. He's talking about wonderful things. And many people become Christians in a wonderful way because of that. But that also within his theology, there are some really wonky elements some really wonky elements, you know. And these will take a thousand years to come to a head. And in that time, as in other parts of Europe, they will do their own destructive work. However, he comes with that theology, he comes with that faith, with all of its strengths, with all of its weaknesses. He comes with a very high notion that evangelism, that mission is dealing with facing up to the demonic and in Christ's power overcoming the demonic and setting people free. And so when it comes to see King Brood and Craig Patrick in this wonderful photograph that we have of that particular meeting, then that was the form of the gospel that he brought. And there are various features come through. 
Firstly, as we've emphasized before, his main motivation is to save sinners from a lost eternity. That, that is crystal clear. That is why he's doing this job. But what we find that when he is a, a missionary, it's not what we call a top-down model of evangelism. One, one scholar who, who writes in this field, um, the aforementioned James E. Fraser, in, in his book, An Early Scottish History, in, in the New Edinburgh um, History of Scotland series, he says very boldly, well, what happened then was that the, the early Celtic missionaries came, they converted the chief, and then the chief forced all people in, in his tribe to convert after that. And James E. Fraser says that quite boldly. And there isn't a scrap of evidence in Scotland or in, our, in Scotland for that happening at all. Not until the Viking time of the Vikings and it happens up in Orkney there. But Mount Columba and his contemporaries, that's not what happened. They didn't get the top man converted and then the top man made sure that all his people followed suit. They worked with a different model, as we'll see. There was no high profile conversion of a king. It's high, un, highly unlikely, for example, that King Brood up in Inverness here ever converted. Um, you get plaques. I think there's a plaque in Inverness that said he did. But there's no evidence for that. There is no contemporary evidence. There is no record of King Brood's baptism. There is no document in which the, the, the people of the Iona monastic community celebrate that such a great leader has been converted, and they would have if he had. And the only reference to King Brood being converted comes 900 years later in what's called the Pictish Chronicle, which is very unreliable. And so the mo greater likelihood is that Brood remained a pagan, but as Jamie said at the beginning, he permitted his people to be evangelized. And that's not unlikely. That, that's not uncommon. In 19th century missions in southern Africa, that happened with several powerful chiefs like Maselikatsi, Muthubi, and so on. They gave permission for their people to be evangelized, even though they themselves did not convert. Instead, we have a scenario in which households come to faith one by one. And this is what a dominant seems to represent. And in his book, he has three clear narratives of family, families being converted. There's a family in Skye. There's a family in the Great Glen somewhere. And there's a family at Glen Urquhart, near where Castle Urquhart is today. And we have quite a lot of detail in these. And each conversion story involves family conversions rather than tribal or national conversions. And this replicates the style of mission found in the Acts of the Apostles. So in the Acts of the Apostles, you have various families being converted. You don't have great kings being converted. And it may be that Adomnan wrote his narrative to echo what we find in the Acts of the Apostles. For Columba, evangelism centers on confronting the demonic. Spiritual release has to precede understanding and faith. And Satan is a strong man whose grip has to be broken, and only after the strong man's grip is overcome can the gospel be received. And so Jesus entered his territory when he's lifted up on the cross, and similarly in evangelism, Jesus enters demonic territory when his people announce and exalt him in the presence of his enemies. And this can be done through prayer or praise or proclamation. But the fundamental principle is it's no good trying to explain the gospel to someone. It's no good trying to explain the gospel to somebody's mind if that person has not yet been released from captivity to the, to the evil one. That has to come first. Tools of evangelism. The first is prayer and praise, especially singing the Psalms. And there's one story in Adomnan, it speaks of um, Columba and his monks just down the slope from Cary Patrick, probably near where James' house is today, uh, and they're trying to have evening prayers. And then a load of druids come along and make a noise trying to disrupt this. 
But they don't argue with these druids. All they do is they, they, they sing more and they, 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 they read the scriptures more, believing that by exalting God's name, simply doing that, 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 that brings God into the situation. God lives in the praises of his people and the demonic has to flee. When God is exalted, the demonic has to flee. So prayer and praise is itself a tool of evangelism. The other tool is the power of the word. A proclamation, preaching heralds Christ. It publicly reveals him. And the heralding of Christ puts the demonic to flight. You don't need to argue a case. You simply proclaim what is the truth. And that brings Christ into a situation. The demonic is put to flight. And after the demonic is put to flight, the mind can begin to understand. And the mind has to be set free from its captivity before it can know the truth. And what happens is that our fall into sin is then is then reversed. Because our sin created separation from God leading to bondage to Satan. When people are evangelized, that is reversed. It creates freedom from Satan leading to reunion with God. And so the whole way of thinking is about releasing sinners, releasing fallen men and women from the authority, the, the pseudo-authority of the evil one. And another thing that Scumba would use that um, good Presbyterians might not use quite so often perhaps would be the sign of the cross, prominent in Athanasius' life of Anthony. And Columba would see making the sign of the cross not just a symbol of Calvary. He would understand it as a visual preaching. It's a visual declaration of the power of deliverance over Satan, which Calvary accomplished. So for, for, for Columba, making the sign is heralding Christ, is proclaiming Christ visibly. You know, we have all these um, high Celtic crosses in, in, in our culture, these ancient Celtic crosses. We have these big high slab, cross slabs in our culture, especially up by, by Nig and so on. And I think one of the reasons why they built them so high wasn't just to impress, but it's to repeat what we mentioned before. It lifts Christ, it lifts holy things high into demonic territory. And in doing that, it makes a visual statement of Christ's triumph. The sign of the cross proclaims Christ, and Christ being exalted, the demonic has to yield. So, for example, when Columba came to the gates of King Brede's fort at Craig Patrick, he was going up the slope, it says up a steep slope, and just almost when he got to the gates, the king gave a command and the gates were shut in Columba's face. And what was happening there, I think, was that Brady was really saying, look, I want to show who's boss here. I've got this holy man coming up. I'm going to see him. But before he comes up, I'm going to close the gates in his face to show that I'm the king. Now, what's interesting in, is that in the story, what happens then is that Columba makes the sign of the cross. And at the sign of the cross, according to Adomnan, the gates fly open. And Brady is so astounded and overcome by this. Why is, he over, why is he astounded? I don't think he's astounded because it's just a, a nature miracle. I think what he's astounded at is that the authority that he had has been conquered by the authority that was displayed in the sign of the cross that Columba made. It's a clash of authority that takes place in that incident. It's not just an amazing event a clash of authority. This Christ has an authority greater than the pseudo-authority of your pagan religion. And that's what's being established at that point. And so conversion is seen in terms of release and response. In Celtic evangelism, in Columbus evangelism, in the evangelism that comes to Scotland in, its, in, its, in, in, in the very beginning of its time of Christian faith, and I think also in the evangelism takes place in some of the frontier situations around the world today. The road to faith does not begin with intellectual issues. 
the assent to Christian truth eventually becomes part of faith. Instead, the road to faith begins when the power of Satan over heart, mind, and soul is broken. And this enables freed men and women to respond to the triumphant Christ. And breaking the rule of the powers of evil is critical in the Celtic Christian mindset in both evangelism and in discipleship. And with Satan's power broken, a whole people then might respond. And there can be mass conversion, but not because of coercion, but because a whole people have been released from a demonic power. And therefore it can respond rationally, as Columba would say, to truth about God and truth about themselves. Just one more slide. Columbus legacy. Irish Celtic Christianity evangelizes great swathes of Scotland, especially the Western Isles, the Highlands, seeps into the borders, and of course over into Northumbria at the invitation of King Oswald. In 630s, King Oswald, this is 40 years after Columba dies, King Oswald of Northumbria asks for I Iona missionaries and Iona Celtic Christianity evangelizes large areas of continental Europe also at the same time. The Irish church, the Irish monasteries were independent, autonomous units making their own decision. And they were very active, very missionary minded, very evangelically minded there. And then there was a pushback as Roman Christianity from the continent sought to establish its authority and it pushes back into Britain, it pushes north and eventually Celtic Christianity begins to lose its influence. But echoes of Columban Christianity remain even when Scotland accepts what we call Roman forms after the 7th century. But Columba cements the penitential system into Christian piety. And central in his own life, his own devotional life, is the idea of penance, of doing penance to help atone for your sins alongside what Jesus did on the cross. It's what we call semi-Pelagianism. And this becomes endemic, not just in Ireland, not just in Scotland, not just in England, but it becomes endemic all over Europe. That the gospel is about God doing a bit and you also doing a bit. As we said before, this is why we have to have the Reformation in the 16th century, which says it is all of grace. It is all God's work. And you can be assured because of that. The end. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Bruce. Fascinating paper. Uh, questions, folks. I'm sure there are questions. Anyone? Back here. So let me repeat the question as I understood it. So do you correct me if I got it wrong? Uh, although there, are, there isn't quite such a strong connection with Reformed Christianity, was that what you were saying to start with? There seems to be a, more of a connection with elements of charismatic Christianity, binding of the devil, demons, and so on, that kind of thing. Thoughts? Is that fair somewhere? Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think I think um, I think there's some validity in what you're saying there. I think earlier when I was saying that. Um, you know, Reformed theology doesn't sit comfortably with Columbus theology. I was thinking more of his doctrine of salvation and the idea that there was very little assurance um, for the faith of these early Celtic Christians. You know, right up to the moment of death, they weren't certain whether they would make that final transition from earth to glory 
uh, there was a real uncertainty about that, even though they had been fine Christian people all all their lives. So they didn't have that, you know, once saved, always saved aspect. Concerning the, the emphasis on the demonic, um, uh, Andrew would correct me on this, um, but there have been quite a number of Reformed theologians who have taken the demonic and this kind of thing quite seriously. Um, but certainly it is a true it, it is, I think, true that it's more obvious in more charismatic um, churches nowadays. But what I found, um, it depends which culture we're living in. You know, we're living in a, <coughs> a post-Christian um, enlightenment society, rationalistic society, which eliminates uh, spiritual factors from the way that we're meant to think. But in other cultures, which still admit spiritual factors as being a vital way in which humans think, this kind of emphasis is readily applicable. Um, and the whole idea of Christ as the triumphant one over Satan being the dominant way in which you understand salvation. For example, when I was teaching in Africa, this was the way in which my African students understood it most readily. You know, you, you, you would teach very diligently um, and, and quite correctly, you know, Christ has paid our ransom, Christ takes our pelt on the cross, etc., etc., etc. But the one that resonated was that he is the one who defeats the forces of Satan and he is the one who sets you free. There. And I think there's other societies as well, Southeast Asia and so on, where, where that also would find great resonance. And perhaps it may be that in in, in a truly post-Christian society, that will find resonance within our land as well, as people begin to be affected by all kinds of forces. But yeah, th thank you. My question is this. What about the Iona community? Have they lost the plot from what you've said tonight? I wouldn't like to answer that directly um, at all. I, I think that, you know, certainly, you know, I indicated when we were talking about the, the, the what we might call green theology, that, that then, then certainly I in a community would, would tend towards interpreting the early Celtic saints in a much um, more positive light in terms of, of, of harmony with creation. Uh, Gilbert Marcus, in a couple of his excellent books, on early Celtic Christianity, he does emphasize um, the, the, the genuine concern that the likes of a dominant, for example, Columbus biographer had for justice and peace issues. And, and we have the law of a dominant, which was the first universal charter protecting women and children in, in time of war and battle and so on. And so the likes of Gilbert Marcus and maybe people in the Iowa community would want to emphasize that aspect of Celtic theology. As I said before, the, the maybe not so keen on emphasizing that sinners have to be rescued from a lost eternity. Um, so the things that they do emphasize are there, but there are bits that they don't bring out, which are absolutely central, you know, rescuing souls um, from a lost eternity. And interesting, um, Ian Bradley, who, who, who's very sympathetic to the Iona community, in his book on Columba, his little book on Columba, he, he acknowledges this. And he says, you know, the picture of Columba being painted nowadays is not the real Columba. The real Columba is much more, I think these are his words, uh, is much more a fundamentalist Presbyterian <laughs> than, than what many would want to acknowledge. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Okay, okay, hold on just now, DJ. Okay, fine. That is the um, the Celtic when the Celtic saint makes a sign of the cross, like, like, like that. Some books say that it's like that, but in this particular absolutely genuine photograph, they, 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 they have it like that. 
Uh, other traditions have a slightly different way of making the sign of the cross. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, make, 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 making the blessing, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, when the picture went off, I thought of another question, which, wa which is, was St. Columba married? No, no. Was he celibate? Yes. That's, that's an interesting one. Um, basically, if you were a monk within a monastery, you were meant to be celibate. You could be a monk outside a monastery, outside permanent living in a monastic community, um, manachs, and you would not necessarily be celibate. Within Irish Christianity, and in fact quite widespread over the continent, many priests were married. It was only much later on that various edicts came from Rome trying to enforce celibacy. But right up until the 10th, 11th century, they were having difficulty enforcing that in Scotland, Ireland, Wales, and so on. And it's shown that they had difficulty enforcing that because they have to issue the edict again and again and again. But within Irish Christianity, from which Scottish Christianity of that type emerges, it was accepted that a priest could be married. Um, Patrick's father, grandfather, was a married priest and so on. So it wasn't as if they were married unofficially. It was accepted. And, and, and the later idea of celibacy came in on top of that late, late, later on. Yeah. Okay, folks, we've maybe, maybe got time for another couple of questions. Ian. Can you keep asking the question for a while? <laughs> uh, <laughs> there. I think, I think this emphasis on spiritual warfare as being a very important thing for Christian believers to be aware of. Um, I know that there are some Christians who go overboard on aspects of it, but I think um, realizing that there is an enemy um, you know, who, who is opposing the work of God and, and therefore that, that has certain consequences. I, I think awareness of that, a greater awareness of that would be invaluable. Yeah. Hey, to what extent do you think subsequent generations of writers were influenced by, self, by, by Columba? Going back to warfare, I'm thinking of John Bunyan, the Pilgrim's Progress, but in particular, the Holy War. Um, echoes of, of Columbus um, coming. There are indeed, but I don't, think I don't think the echoes are there because they're echoing Columba. I think the echoes are there because they're finding that in Scripture. Um, maybe they, they may be expressed in a slightly different way, but fundamentally they see that reality in, in, in Scripture itself. You know, you can't read the Gospels without realizing that there's something going on here more than just what is on the human level. Um, and so I think that the likes of Bunyan and the Puritans are echoing that rather than borrowing from the likes of the Celtic saints directly there. That, 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 that would be my feeling. Yeah. Thanks so much. Professor, thanks to Bruce once again, folks. Thank you, sir. And can I remind you of the bookstall? And can I invite you all through for tea and coffee? Uh, but just before we go, I've asked uh, if uh, Bruce will pray a benediction on us. Thank you, sir. Just stand for the benediction. Let's all just say the grace together. May the grace 
of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.